All right, well, let's begin tonight. I felt uh, like I needed to put a pause on the end of the age series and, uh, and, and hit something that's extremely relevant, very controversial uh, within Christianity today. I put a post on Facebook uh, this afternoon, or I saw a post was put on Facebook this afternoon about me doing this teaching tonight. And uh, scores of comments uh, and dialogue and debate are all over the place. Uh, Christians saying, I think there's nothing wrong with keeping Halloween. Other ones saying, no, we shouldn't keep it on Halloween. And we, we could do it, but here's how you need to do it. And everything in between. And so there's definitely not a lot of clarity on this subject just by the comments that were placed uh, today on Facebook. So tonight I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the evening in this teaching going through and unpacking where Halloween came from. Should Christians and should, should believers celebrate this holiday? If we should celebrate this holiday, holiday, how do we celebrate this holiday? Should we have an alternative to this holiday? So on and so forth. So we're going to answer all of those questions and more. And in PFT fashion, we're going to dig back into real history, pull out facts. We're not going to pull out opinions. We're not going to pull out uh, church-run facts uh, of rewriting history. We're going to go all the way back thousands of years, and we're going to discover where the roots of Halloween came from. Are you ready? All right, let's dig in. Today, it is the second most popular holiday next to Christmas. Can you believe that? And you should believe that because when you walk into the stores in August, there are Halloween uh, costumes and paraphernalia starting to be put up in Walmarts and in grocery stores and so on and so forth. They're rearranging aisles to make room for all of that stuff that people buy. It is the second most popular holiday. Over $15 billion will be spent around holidays, excuse me, around Halloween. $15 billion is going to be spent this year on Halloween. Get this, over 400 million of that is going to be spent on pets getting costumes. That's how ridiculous it is today. People are now getting costumes for their pets. You can't, you can't leave uh, the pet out of the equation. So 400 million will be spent on pet costumes alone. Listen, more and more Christians are engaging in Halloween and being encouraged to do so by their pastors, bishops, priests, elders, and even some of the most prominent Christian leaders in America. Recently, an article was, was given by one of the most popular Christian actors in America today, interviewed in the Huffington Post as of this week, coming out and saying that Christians should have the largest block parties on uh, the planet, in America, on Halloween. Here's what he had to say. This comes directly from the Christian Post, one of the largest Christian newspapers online. Quote, early on, Christians would dress up in costumes as the devil, ghosts, goblins, and witches, precisely to make the, port, uh, the point that those things were defeated and overthrown by the resurrected Jesus Christ. You should have the biggest party on your block, he told CP, Christian Post. Halloween gives you the opportunity to show how Christians celebrate the day that death was defeated and you can give them gospel tracts and tell the story of how every ghost, goblin, witch, and demon was trounced the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Clearly, no Christians ought to be glorifying death because death was defeated. And that, that was the point of All Hallows' Eve. Now, at a cursory view, this might even inspire some of you. It looks good. It sounds good. It sounds spiritual. But what I want to do as a historian is I want to go back and I want to unpack these historical statements that he just made and make sure that they're accurate. Because when you say that early on Christians would dress up in costumes, well, how early are you talking? How early are you talking about in the 70s? Or 70 AD, there is a big difference. And so there is a, there is a, a connotation that comes from this. There's an aroma that comes from these quotes that make you feel 
like he's talking about early Christians. When I say early Christians, I am clearly talking about first century Christians. Most Christians, when they read this, would automatically put that mindset in. So there is, in a way, a very deceiving, even though I believe it's completely unintentional uh, by the one who made this statement, but there is a deceiving uh, uh, t- a color that comes from this that, listen, early Christians dressed up like ghosts and goblins, and the point and the purpose of doing that was to, to mock them. So I, am, I took the liberty upon myself to go back in history, hundred year by hundred year, millennium by millennium, all the way back thousands of years to find out where these traditions came from, to find out that is this statement true? Did anyone at any time outside of modern history ever dress up to mock demons? We're going to discover that. And then lastly, I highlighted this one quote. It was the point of All Hallows' Eve was to, uh, was to show that Jesus rose from the dead, and the point was to show that he had victory over death. Let's discover if All Hallows' Eve, which eventually evolved into the term Halloween, if that really was an accurate statement, did it really start out, and is the point and purpose of All Hallows' Eve to glorify life? Let's dig in. First of all, the history of Halloween starts with a holiday, an ancient Celtic holiday. It's not pronounced Samhain. It's pronounced Samhain, okay? So Samhain is an ancient Celtic holiday that is thousands of years old. And this is where virtually all scholars in academia find their way back to when they want to do historical traces of Halloween. This is actually where you go to. All Saints Day, or All Hallows' Eve, is much later on the timeline, as we're going to discover. So I want to go to Encyclopedia Britannica. I trust Encyclopedia Britannica on most things. They do a pretty good job at doing historical records. So let's find out from them a little bit about this this Halloween day. In ancient Britain and Ireland, the Celtic festival of Samhain Eve was observed on October 31st at the end of summer. It was an occasion for one of the ancient fire festivals when huge bonfires were set on hill, hilltops to frighten away evil spirits. The souls of the dead were thought to revisit their homes on this day, and the autumn festival acquired sinister significance with ghosts, witches, hobgoblins, black cats, fairies, and demons of all kinds said to be roaming about. In addition, Halloween was thought to be the most favorable time for divinations concerning marriage, luck, health, and death. So right away, if I did not tell you this was the festival of Samhain, you would automatically be thinking Halloween because this describes it to a T and we haven't even gotten started yet. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Samhain, also spelled this way, one of the most important and sinister calendar festivals of the Celtic year at Samhain held on November 1st, so it's October 31st uh, to November 1st. The world of the gods was believed to be made visible to mankind, and the gods played many tricks on their mortal worshipers. It was a time fraught with danger, charged with fear, and full of supernatural episodes. Sacrifices and propitiations of every kind were thought to be vital, for without them the Celts believed they would not prevail over the perils of the season or counteract the activities of the deities. Samhain was an important precursor to Halloween. So ladies and gentlemen, we see right off the bat that the actual origin of Halloween had nothing to do with All Hallows' Eve that we're going to see uh, evolved into, from the Catholic Church, that its roots go all the way back into a pagan cultic festival called Samhain, where they believed that the curtain or the veil between earth and the second dimension of the demons of the demonic realm or the place of the dead was thinned. And at that place on October 31st and November 1st, the veil was thinned and that allowed spirits of the dead to transfer from the place in the abode of the dead into the place of the living. And because of that, Uh, There were many supernatural things that happened uh, during those time periods. And so a lot of cultural traditions developed to counter what they called, uh, some of them, the gods. Okay, Today, even, 
in Satanism, the high holy day, guess when it is? October 31st. Where do you think they get that from? Is it made up? They too believe. The Wiccans believe. The actual pagan religion, the pagans believe. They'll even tell you on their own websites that you, I saw this quote, it said, Christians, comma, you can thank us for Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. And they know that. And actually, I read multiple articles on pagan, Wiccan, and cult, occultic websites that are angry that Christians celebrate their holidays. They feel like that Christians are, uh, are hijacking their holy days. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a strange paradox when you have Satanists that are upset because Christians are celebrating their holy day. Something's not right uh, with that statement. And as we go walk through the timeline here, you're going to find out, we're going to find out whether Christians can hijack, whether we should redeem and whether it can be redeemed or not. What does the Bible say? So first of all, in the history timeline from the Celts, they celebrated this festival called Samhain. And then along came the Romans and the Romans took over the Celts. After conquering the Irish and the Celts in the first century, Samhain began to get mixed with two other Roman feasts for the dead, because the Romans had their own feasts for the dead. Those were called Pomona Day and Feralia. So Pomona Day and Feralia, two feasts that were integrated into Samhain. How many know that every time a country takes over another country, there's a mixture of traditions? Okay. What is the best expression of that here in the United States? Everything we do. The United States is a melting pot, is it not? So look at all the traditions from, from Ireland that have come in, uh, from Scotland, from, uh, from even Great Britain, uh, from Mexico. Okay, There is all kinds of traditions that are, are, are melt in a, in a culture that gets mixed with another culture. And that's exactly what happened when the Romans took over the Celts in the first century, is that the Samhain festival, the Romans now are living amongst the Celts, the Celts are living amongst the Romans, and there was a mixture of, hey, that's kind of cool in your holiday, let's mix that in here, and that's pretty neat, you guys do that, let's do this. And then those holidays began to merge. So I'm going to show you some of the things and how they merged on the timeline. For instance, Feralia was held on February 21st and was the day to honor the dead. But like other Roman holidays, it was completely filled with drunkenness, orgies, fornication, all kinds of crazy stuff, very similar to the Feast of Saturnalia, of which was a 12-day feast, of which we get the 12 days of Christmas from. Yes, I'm sorry if you haven't watched Truth or Tradition, now would probably be a good time to do that before you get too upset with me. Uh, but yes, that's, that's where these holidays come from. They come all the way back into the 2,000 plus years ago. Pomona Day, on the other hand, was November 1st. This was a day to honor the goddess Pomona, who's the goddess of trees, fertility, and fruits. And you know what her sacred symbol was? None other than the apple. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit later. And uh, you'll see that there's a connection all the way back to the garden of why her significant or her symbol was the apple. So there was a day in Roman uh, Roman times on November 1st called Pomona Day. That's where they honored the goddess Pomona. And she, her major symbol was the apple. And of course, she was the goddess of fruit trees. Next comes along the Catholic Church. Just a few hundred short years later, we've got this. Having multiple days for remembering the dead saints and martyrs, the Catholic Church agreed that there should be one day for all of the saints. And so what was happening in Catholicism, very, very early Catholicism in the third and fourth century, is that uh, a martyr or what they would can be considered a saint, and you were automatically a saint if you were martyred, and that's how they began. So when you became a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, they believed in remembering your death and, and, and honoring you in your death. And that's fine and dandy. But what happened was multiple people began to be saints, so many that they, were, they would have dates booked up every month throughout the month. They were remembering the dead every day. 
So there was a logic that went in that said, hey, listen, there's too many uh, dead saints to all remember individually. Let's package them all together. A political, logical move was made, and let's put them all into one day, and we'll call it All Saints Day. So with the backing of the Roman government, okay, because at that time, the church and the government were working hand in hand, it was decided to whitewash the Roman day of the dead and turn it into the day of remembering and praying to the dead saints. So remember, much of what we get in history today comes from a political process, a compromising of church and state for the betterment of the people. So uh, in quotes there. Because what happened was, is that they, they thought, okay, there's already a day of remembering the dead in Rome. So in the church side of Rome, this, this, the, the church side of Rome and the state side of Rome, the church side of the Rome, who's in, really connected arm and, and body with the state side of Rome or the government side said, well, if we're going to do that, let's just pick a day that will be easier for everybody. And let's take over the Roman day of the dead, because we don't really agree with that whole Roman day of the dead anyway. But if we use their day, then uh, people will remember the saints. And so that was the logic behind that. And really, ultimately, it kind of made sense. If you didn't have a biblical background uh, and you didn't know what the front of the book said, then this was a good move. And so they made this move and that day ended up being when you get to Ephraim Cyrus, who died in 373, he mentions that there's a feast dedicated to the saints in his writing. So we know historically that as early as in the 370s, that there would definitely was one day set aside to remember the saints. Then comes along John Chrys uh, Chrysostom, who died in 407. Now this guy, if you do any homework on him, he's major, major saint in Catholicism. Not only in Catholicism, but he's, he's one of the saints that has crossed over into Protestantism and became a church father or someone that is held in tremendous high esteem in Protestantism. Uh, even Christianity Today, I believe, uh, wrote an article about and esteemed him greatly. Uh, as a church leader, he was called the golden mouth because he was so articulate. He captivated thousands of people with his messages and his sermons. And he was only in his 20s when he went into full-time ministry. He was very, very gifted, came from a wealthy family. The problem with Mr. Uh, Chrysostom is that he lacked a true biblical understanding of the Hebraic background of the faith. And so it would not surprise you that he was incredibly anti-Semitic. And so when you come, he comes along, what he does is he puts a stamp on this All Saints Day, and he says that we're going to fix it to the first Sunday after Pentecost. Then from him, we're actually going to make this even more solid. The name was changed because the name originally was Ferelia. Even though they, they, they had it for All Saints Day, there was no All Saints Day name. It was a day for all the saints, but they still used the name Feralia. So they changed the name from Feralia to All Saints Day. And the date was changed to kill two birds with one stone. They changed it to May 13th. <clears throat> May 13th, 609 AD, Pope Boniface IV dedicated the Pantheon in Rome in commemoration of all Christian martyrs. And that, even in his historical Catholic records, is the day that All Saints Day was born. Now, what their historians will tell you in Catholicism is that All Saints Day was born right here in 609 AD, had nothing to do with paganism, and it had to do with the the uh, uh, the christening, if you will, of the Pantheon to be a church and to remember all of the martyrs in All Saints Day. The problem is that they didn't just choose May 13 as a, just an a ambiguous number picked out of a hat to commemorate uh, the Christian church here at, uh, at Rome, the Pantheon. It was chosen for a reason. May 13 was chosen. Why was it chosen May 13th? Because that was the day of the Roman Lemuria Festival. So the Lemuria festival was a major pagan festival where the head of the household would get up at midnight and perform a ritual to exercise and remove dead spirits 
from their homes. So the Catholic Church's agenda throughout the centuries was to take the pagan holidays and begin to take them over, which sounds totally spiritual. We're going to discover as we go on is, is, not, is that biblical? Do we have the right to take over these days or not? And I know many of you that are in the sound of my voice so already have your mind maybe made up or you have your own opinion. Hold with me on this. Let's find out if their agenda worked because ultimately you know it by the fruit. So let's discover if this was a good plan. This dates all the way back to the 6th century BC, by the way, this Lemuria festival. So they chose this to try to hijack this Lemuria festival, this Roman pagan feast of the dead. So then it was moved again. This time it was moved to Samhain Day. Why? Because noticing that the Celts that they took over, okay, in the first century are still celebrating Samhain. And Samhain's on October 31st through November 1st. So Pope Gregory III in 70, uh, 741 AD moved All Saints Day to November 1st to dedicate the new All Saints Chapel. Makes sense. In St. Peter's Rome. At the same time, making an effort to Christianize the pagan feast of the same, the same name. So what's happening on the same day is that the Catholic Church is attempting to throw holy water on pagan feasts. They're attempting to Christianize something that is demonic. So let me ask a question. Would we all agree that the pagan feast Samhain festival, which was a pagan feast of the dead, is not from God? I want you to remember that. Something that's not from God, God doesn't want it's a simple logic that we need to remember as we walk through here. So All Souls Day. What is All Souls Day? Well, that happens to be the next day after All Saints Day, November 2nd. Then in 988 AD, the Catholic Church added another day, November 2nd, to remember all of the souls that were suspended in a place called purgatory and needed the prayers of their loved ones. As with the Festival of Saul, when the Catholic believers celebrated with huge bonfires Parades and costumes masquerading as dead saints, angels, and demons. Altogether, All Saints Eve, October 31st, All Saints Day, November 1st, and All Souls Day, November 2nd, combined into what was called Hollow Mass or Holy Mass, imitating to the T the Celtic Feast of Samhain. So they may not have known this because this is now a thousand years after the Celts were celebrating Samhain for already hundreds of years before that. But these people that were alive at this time that are celebrating in costumes, masquerading as dead spirits, demons, dead saints, bonfires, and all these things were literally imitating the very Celtic pagan demonic feast from a thousand years earlier and they didn't even know it. I submit to you today that we're doing the exact same thing. Call it what you want. Do it however you want. If an ancient Celt showed up today, he'd feel right at home. From All Saints Day to Halloween, how did that jump happen? In 1556, the Scottish term All Hallows Eve began to be used. So in 1500s is when we see the first term all Hallows Eve. And so when a famous Christian actor says that this is the original uh, point of Halloween, it comes from All Hallows Eve, that word wasn't even used until the mid-1500s. Its actual meaning means hallowed evening or holy evening. When the phrase was used in the English language of the West in 1745, it was pronounced Halloween. That's where it comes from. So Halloween comes from All Hallows Eve, which means holy evening. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to ask even an average Christian, would you consider Halloween holy? Yes or no? 
I would bet, I would hope, 90 plus percent would say no. So then if the answer is no, why do we even call it holy evening? Because that's exactly what we're saying. It doesn't matter if it's a coined phrase called Halloween. You're literally saying this is a holy night. So if you're going to be at least intellectually honest and you choose to celebrate Halloween, at least come up with a different name. Then what happened? The Irish potato famine in 1846. How on earth does an Irish potato famine have anything to do with Halloween? You might be thinking to yourself, it has absolutely everything to do with Halloween. Why? Because the Celts come from there. So you have millions of Irish and Scottish settlers that are coming into the United States in the 1840s. And guess what they're bringing with them? The Samhain Festival. This is how it came to America. So in the 1840s is when you see millions of Irish Celts used to celebrating Samhain, immigrating to America during this time, had major, major impact on what Halloween actually looks like today. It's coming all the way back thousands of years. The Samhain Festival is reoccurring here in the United States. So let's ask this question. So was the point of All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve to dress up like demons, to show that death was defeated, like some influential Christian leaders would have you believe? Let's answer that question because ultimately it is the reason and fundamental foundation of that particular Christian leader's philosophy, or dare I say theology, of why he believes celebrating Halloween should be uh, not only available to Christians, but we should actually engage in it. That's the premise. Let's find out. What is All Saints Day? Because this is what it is. Halloween is All Saints Day. Catholics celebrate All Saints Day and All Souls Day in the fundamental belief that there is a prayerful spiritual communion between those in the state of grace who have died and are either being purified in purgatory, a holding place, or are in heaven. And the church militant who are the living. So basically, All Saints Day is, is a commemoration where they pray to the dead saints. And the dead saints intercede for them. Even though my Bible tells me when you're dead, you're dead. There is no interceding for the living from the people of the dead. That's what our Bible says. And my Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Yeshua. Not some dead guy. All Souls Day, which is November 2nd, is a day of remembering and praying for the dead to be purified and brought into heaven. So the very two days, All Saints Day and All Souls Day, did not originate with the Catholic Church, but built on pagan, cultic, demonic practices of festivals, they pray for dead Catholic saints and pray for dead Catholic family members that they can get out of purgatory and eventually get into heaven. Nothing in the historical record says that Catholics ever dressed up ever to mock demons or mock death. That is not the historical record, as you're going to find out. Let's look into Hebrews chapter 9 and talk about praying for the dead. Verse 27, it says, And as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment once to die, then judgment. There is nothing in between of an opportunity to go from death, eternal death, to eternal life once you're dead. Once you're dead, it's over with. Your judgment is sealed. Think about the logic. If you died and you knew there was an eternal life, you probably would repent. Who wouldn't? There wouldn't even be a need for a lake of fire. But beyond that, let's continue. Psalms 115, 17 says, The dead praise not Yahweh, neither any that go down into silence. 
But we will bless Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. The dead can't praise the Lord. Think about this. So if they can't praise the Lord because they're dead, how do they pray for you? Because we are to believe, and I, I grew up Catholic to the sixth grade, so I'm very familiar with this. They have all kinds of saints that you ask the saint to pray for you. How can the saint pray for you if he's dead and he can't even praise the Lord? Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, for the, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Why don't they know anything? Because they're waiting for the resurrection. Why? It's judgment. They're not allowed to speak. That's why the witch of Endor, uh, Saul had to call up Samuel. And Samuel says, what? What did you wake me up for? Necromancy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, it says, there shall not be found among you Anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or is a sorcerer. Listen to this. Or one who conquers spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead or calls upon the dead. Why am I going through all this? Because I'm trying to put some weight and gravity on this holiday's reality of what it means to the ones who made it. This is what they believe. When you celebrate Halloween, you are engaging in a belief system of necromancy. You are engaging in a belief system of calling upon the dead. You may not call upon the dead. You can say all day long, well, that's not what Halloween means to me. Well, when was the last time that God ever cared about what it meant to you? Because the last time I checked, when they hooked up that whole golden calf thing, and they said, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to Yahweh, Yahweh wasn't too happy that that golden calf was replacing Moses, who they thought died on the mountain, and they thought they were worshiping Yahweh through this golden calf. And God said, no, nope, sorry, I understand your hearts are sincere, but I just want to let you guys know something. Let me whisper it in your ear. I don't care about your sincerity. I care that you worship me the way I have asked to be worshiped. Don't build me a golden, golden calf. I will not accept that. Matter of fact, I'll call it idolatry. Because what happened in Egypt, outside of Egypt, when they built that golden calf, ladies and gentlemen, that was the exact same thing that the Catholics tried to do to the Celtic cultic festival of Samhain. They tried to redeem it, sprinkle a little holy water on it, and then worship Yahweh with that. Some of you go, what are you talking about? That, it, 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 the, the golden calf was another god. No, it wasn't. There's two perspectives in the Bible. There's your perspective and there's his. Read the text. From the perspective of the Israelites, Moses has been gone for 40 days. They thought he was dead. And you have to know Egyptian culture and Egyptian religion to know that they did not serve the gods directly. They served them through idols. So when they lost this new God called Yahweh, because they, excuse me, they lost the mediator, Moses, to this new God, Yahweh, they knew they could not go directly to Yahweh. So they created another mediator. The text makes it clear. Aaron says, tomorrow we're going to worship Yahweh. So from their perspective, their hearts are true. Their hearts are sincere. They don't want to leave God. They're going to serve Yahweh. And that's why they're all excited. Do you really think they're that dumb that they're going to receive the Ten Commandments? They're going to have all the, you know, are, you know are about to receive the Ten Commandments. The Red Sea opens up. They see this incredible miracle. All the Egyptians behind them die. And they're just going to worship another God at the base of the mountain that, they, you know, <laughs> that they're hearing voices from? No. This is exactly what we're doing. We're taking pagan feast from Egypt, melting it down, recasting it, and offering it to God and expecting him to take it. Oh, but it's for the people. It's easier to witness to the people. Let's, let's continue. I'm starting to preach. Any intentional communication with the dead is forbidden in Scripture. And it's called an abomination. 
1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. There is no other mediator. To put a cap on this, think about this. There are so many days of the dead. So for a Christian leader to say that this is a Christian holiday, it does not find its roots in paganism. It actually is a, a Christian holiday. And they quote All Saints Day by default. I'm sorry if this, this steps on toads that are out there. But by default, that Christian leader or Christian period is stamping the Roman Catholic Church as Christian. You're literally saying, and you may believe that, and that's fine. But understand what you're stay, saying, Mr. Christian leader. If you have the audacity to say that Halloween is a Christian holiday and doesn't come out of roots of paganism, and we know historically, and you admit in your quote that it comes from Catholicism, then you're saying the Roman Catholic Church, which was about as pagan as the state of Rome at the time that that, that was created, you're literally saying, well, why don't you say that the rest of the Catholic holidays are Christian as well? Why don't you just become Catholic? Because this is not my quote. I just quoted a Catholic bishop. Because that's exactly what their upper echelon leadership doesn't understand. How can Protestants keep our Sabbath on Sunday, keep our holy days, and not be Catholic? Do you know why? Because Protestantism came out of Catholicism. We are simply the redheaded stepchild of Catholicism. We don't know how Catholic we really are. Look how many cultures have a day of the dead, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for getting so fired up. No, I don't, because God's fired up. He's tired of the compromise in his church. This is no Christian holiday, my friends, in origin. If it was, we wouldn't find it in every culture on earth. The Mexican Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos. It goes back to the ancient festival of the dead, celebrated by the Aztecs. The Aztecs were had a day of the dead. Guatemala, this is where Guatemala's Day of the Dead comes from as well. Listen to this, Brazil. China, Japan, Guatemala, Vietnam, Nepal, Philippines, and many, many more. Too many to list. Dozens. All have a day of the dead. So the question becomes, where did they get it from? How could all of these cultures have a day of the dead that predate some of these civilizations, Catholicism? This is why. Because you go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Isn't it something? Nimrod just seems to show up everywhere. Nimrod is the great grandson of Noah. Nimrod was a great and mighty hunter in the land. He's the one that built the cities of Nineveh and Babel. He was the very first deified human being. When you see Baal in your Bible, that's him. He was deified as the sun god. In every known culture around the world, they have a sun god. Hands down. Doesn't matter where you're at, different names, same guy. This is who it is. It's Nimrod. The reincarnated sun god. His wife, Semiramis. Her name in scripture is Ashtaroth or Astarte. In Greek, in The anglicization of Ishtar is Easter. It's where we get Easter from. It's the bare-breasted fertility goddess of the East. It's the sun god, Baal's wife. Again, if you haven't heard that, watch Truth or Tradition to get a background on what I'm talking about. This day of the dead goes all the way back to ancient Babel, to Nimrod. And when God sent the angels down to confound the languages, it is the only conceivable theory of how all of these cultures around the world could have the same day of the dead on the same day, most of them. It's incredible, as I research this, to discover that many of these, most of these have the same day, the day of the dead. 
And there's no way, because they're on completely different sides of the earth, that one could have ever talked to the other. The only conceivable theory is the Tower of Babel. Always you find the sun god, you find Baal, ultimately you find Hasatan. His fingerprints are all over almost everything that we do. Pagan practices for the dead, Leviticus 19, 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. saying, you shall not shave around the sides of your beard, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh. What? For the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. A little small rabbi trail for just a second. A lot of people know about this scripture. They say, oh, you know, you want to keep the front of the book. Well, how come you shave? And they quote this scripture, but not knowing that this scripture is directly talking about practices, pagan practices that the Israelites were starting to adopt from pagan cultures about the dead. And so when their dead would die, the pagan dead would die, their family members would die. They would cut the corners of their beard. They would make markings on themselves and they would put tattoos on themselves for the dead. And Yahweh tells his people, the Israelites, don't do that. It's against my word. I don't want you doing that for the dead. The dead are dead. Yeshua said it this way. Let the dead bury the dead. You can't do anything about it anymore. So focus on the living. So let's go into the origin of holiday traditions and really begin to zoom in here. The Oxford American College Dictionary says this about bonfires. I thought this was interesting. Late Middle English. It's from bone fires. The term originally denoted a large open air fire on which bones were burned, sometimes as part of a celebration. Saw one. Also one for burning heretics or prescribed literature. And so what would happen during the Samhain festivals, they would do these bone fires where they would make human sacrifices and animal sacrifices. They would take the bones of those animals and those humans, and that is where we get the term bonfire from. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have bonfires, you know, uh, you know, on a piece of property or when you're camping or something like that. I'm just telling you etymologically where the word comes from is from killing people. Costumes. Where do costumes come from? Where does dressing up come from? In the Samhain festival, the Celts would wear animal skins and dress up like ghosts, demons, fairies, and the like to trick the wandering spirits into leaving them alone. Now, remember, we started this teaching off with a quote by a famous Christian uh, leader who says that the early Christians dressed up as demons and fairies and goblins and ghosts to mock the demons and death. That is not the origin. The origin comes all the way back to the Samhain festival where they dressed up to protect themselves because they believed in a crazy way that if they dressed up like a demon or a ghost or a goblin, that it would trick the spirits into believing that they were one of them and they would leave them alone. That's where dressing up in costumes comes from. This is why you see three-year-olds wearing demon outfits. And we say, oh, isn't that so cute? Look at Susie with the horns and stuff. No, this practice goes all the way back to the Samhain Festival of the Celts thousands of years ago. Trick-or-treating, where did trick-or-treating come from? Isn't that American custom? No. In the custom of the Samhain festival, families would put food and drink outside the front door to appease the roaming spirits and to keep them from playing tricks on them. By the Middle Ages, poor children would go door to door begging for cakes in exchange for saying prayers for the dead. So this is the evolution of trick-or-treating, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you a story about a friend of mine that came from Kenya, Africa. I met this, this gentleman uh, probably 20 years ago now, 15, 20 years ago. He comes from Kenya. He had never been to the United States before in his life. He worked in an orphanage over there in Kenya. And he happened to come here on October 30th was when his plane landed. Never forget this. 
So the day that I met him was actually the day of October 31st on Halloween. So when I met him, we instantly became good friends and uh, we had a camaraderie there. And he, he, I remember this clear as day. He would say in his accent, Jim, what is happening? What is going on here? And he was freaking out. Literally, he told me that when he got off of his plane and when he was on his way to his, 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 uh, the place where he was staying, he locked the door because of all this Halloween stuff that he was seeing was freaking him out. It was scaring him to death. So he didn't even understand. No one had told him yet what, what, what this was. He had never seen this before. So I, I told this, uh, I, I can't even remember his name. But I asked him, I said, what, I don't understand. What, what is the big deal? It's just Halloween. I didn't have a problem with it at the time. I didn't know anything about it. And he said, you're kidding me. This is, a, this is a game? He's like, you don't even know what you're doing. Where I come from in Kenya, this is real. This is real. We get, every village has a witch doctor. And on this day, we go to the witch doctor and we give him food and drinks in return that he would promise not to put a spell on our family. And on our porches, we take gourds, which is the ancient way of doing it. Pumpkins were found here in America. We hollow them out. We put candles in them and we put them on our front porch to show that we have given food to the witch doctor and to keep the spirits away from our house. Where do you think we get the whole idea of the pumpkins lit on the inside? It's that practice. And so my friend came over here and he sees American Christians doing this. And he, and he said, Christians do this. This is a demonic holiday in Kenya. I don't understand how you guys are making this fun. It's not funny. He was very scared. It just goes to show you that a frog put in a boiling pot will jump out. But you put a frog in a cold water and turn the heat up, stay in there until he dies. And that's where we're at in America. Christianity has got to the place where we don't even see it. We're that oblivious to evil that we're actually okay with dressing up our children as demons, fairies, ghosts, goblins, and avengers. Where did the jack-o'-lantern come from? It's an interesting story. Irish or stingy jack. I love this. So the jack-o'-lantern comes from this story. So there's this, 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 this fable that this guy named uh, Irish Jack cuts a deal with the devil and tricks him to go up a tree. So the devil goes up the tree, and while the, the devil is up in the tree, he carves a cross on the tree, in which the devil can't get down because he won't pass through the cross. And so Jack, being a very greedy man, cuts a deal with the devil and says, devil, I will let you down out of this tree and erase the cross if you will never come after my soul when I die. So the devil agrees makes an oath, races the cross, the devil comes down. Years later, stingy Jack dies. God doesn't let him into heaven because of the terrible lifestyle that he lived. And Satan wouldn't let him into hell because he kept his word. Right there, it tells you it's a fable. <laughs> Not sure how that survived a thousand years, but. And so he, uh, he started coming out of hell uh, Satan sent him out of hell because, uh, because listen, I, I'm going to keep my word. But on his way out of hell, Satan took a coal and threw it at him. And, uh, Jack was eating a turnip at the time. It hit the turnip and it ended up inside the turnip. And so he roams the earth because he can't go to heaven. He can't go to hell. So he roams the earth with a turnip with a light in it. And that ends up being what we call the jack-o'-lantern. Bobbing for apples. Oh, this is a, a very good tradition, right? How many bob for apples when you were a kid? I did. Listen to this. The current game dates back to when the Romans conquered Britain. 
bringing with them the apple tree, a representation of who? The goddess Pomona. The combination of Pomona, the fertility goddess, and the Celts belief that the pentagram was a fertility symbol began the origins of bobbing for apples. So you blindfold yourself, you would go in and you would bob for apples, and that dates back, the apple came in with the Roman feast day of the Pomona day, the goddess of, of, the, uh, of the fruit trees, her symbol was the apple. When it mixed with the day of the dead, this particular custom came out as a rite of celebrating the goddess Pomona, whose fruit was the apple. So the number one million dollar question remains in this controversy, in this discussion in Christianity is, can we redeem Halloween for the Lord? That's what I want to know. Can we redeem it? This comes from a Christian website. This was their scripture that they used saying that we can redeem it. Psalms 24, 1 says, point, points out, they say, that everything belongs to the Lord. Therefore, there is no reason to let Satan have Halloween. It's not his day in the first place. I cocked my head on that one, but I also at the same time looked at it from many Christians perspective that this seems like a rah, rah moment. This seems like a moment that most would say, yeah, let's take it back for God. Let's take it back for Jesus. Take it back means that God had it to begin with. So if we say it's not his day in the first place, then by default, we're saying that it was God's day, but God didn't have Halloween all saints day praying for the dead, praying for the souls that are in purgatory that doesn't exist. Those are not God's days. So I'm going to ask a big question. I'm going to ask some questions here. Bear with me. Is everything the Lord's? Because the scripture says that he's quoting, he believes, says that everything's the Lord's. So I went back and actually read this scripture because I want to know what it actually says. The scripture says, the earth is the Lord's in all of its fullness, talking about creation, the world and those who dwell therein. The context of the scripture is that the earth that I created and everything I created is mine, says the Lord God. So I thought, okay, well, let me give a benefit of the doubt. Does everything mean everything? Is everything really the Lord's? Is July 4th the Lord's Day? Close. I love July 4th. Don't get me wrong. So I, it's like right under like Passover for me. But just because of the fireworks. Don't get me wrong. Is the Satanist high holy day the Lord's Day? Is that the Lord's? How far down the slippery slope do we go? Is Mardi Gras the Lord's? Which day is the Lord's? Because we're saying that everything is the Lord's. So you can say the craziest, most demonic thing that you can think of. And are we to believe that that is the Lord's? That is not the Lord's. Let's find out what the real day of the Lord is. Isaiah 56, 2 says, Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. So in other words, he's saying, let not the Gentile say that I can't be a part of what God's doing with his people. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who, clo who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters, better than the native born Israelites. Do you hear what he's saying right here in Isaiah? It's prophesied that the Gentiles who are not known, if they will come into my covenant and keep my Sabbath, not the Sabbath of the Jews, by the way, it doesn't say that says they're mine, says the Lord, which means that they're not ours. They're his. We get to enter into his stuff. If we do those, he'll make us better than the sons. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, that's us, the words goyim, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone in the world who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant 
Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so we see right off the bat that the day of the Lord, if we're going to talk about a holy day, he calls the Sabbath his holy day. Never in scripture does he call all Hallows Eve my holy day. Yet somehow, some way, we're actually calling something that's profane, holy. When nowhere is it dictated in Scripture that this is a hallowed day. Jim, you're just picking on words. Words mean things. You want to call God Allah? Don't tell me that words don't mean things. Leviticus 23, 39 says, Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord. It does not say feast of the Jews, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that are new and listening to this for the very first time. It does not say that the feast of God are Jewish. It says that they're the feast of the Lord. So if we're to celebrate any feast... This is just my proposition. Should we not at least look at the feasts that God says are his holy days, his feast, and for all time, for all people to be part of his covenant? After all, in the prophets, it says that when Yeshua comes back, we will be celebrating the feast. And it says in Zechariah 14 that if you don't celebrate the feast of the Lord, he will cut off rain from that part of the land. So that's in the millennium. So if we say that they're done away with, we have a problem on our hands because he's bringing them back. God's prophetic calendar. These are his feast days. If you're watching this for the very first time, you've never even heard of this. There's simply seven feast days. Passover, unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits of which Yeshua rose from the dead. He died on Passover, put in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When all the Jews were getting sin out of, out of their house, leaven out of their house, he was removing sin from the house. Pentecost or Shavuot, the Holy Spirit came down on, fulfilling the first of the seven feast days. The top four will be called the spring feast days of the Lord. I encourage you to get, I have a series called the, the God's Prophetic Calendar. Check it out if you've never seen it. We've got over 15 hours of, of information on all of these feast days. The last feast days of the fall are the second coming of the Messiah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's not a coincidence that the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise at the sound of a trumpet. Then there's the Feast of Atonement or the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then finally, the great celebration where there'll be no rain. Amen. Because it seems like every year it rains on the Feast of Sukkot. But in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb that Revelation talks about, these are the feasts of the Lord. These are the calendar days that God says are holy and that are His. So let me ask a question. I'm going to paint a picture and I want, listen, look at me right now. Don't look at the screen. And I want you to, to put yourself back 2,000 years. Every single one of you that are watching today, I know some of you are humoring me and some of you think that I'm way off, but I want you to just answer this question for me. I'm going to paint a picture. We're going to go back 2000 years to the time of the Messiah. And here's my question for every one of you. God creates a holy day. Take off all of your religious baggage. Take off your denominational background. Take off your denominational bias. Take off your opinion on this matter. God comes up to you. He creates a holy day. He calls it Passover. Tells you that you have a meal, to, to have a meal with unleavened bread. To remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then Satan hijacks it, comes to you. So now Satan is talking to you. He tells you to do this. To change the name to the wife of Baal, the goddess of Easter. And start adding in other traditions and pagan, pagan things like dying Easter eggs, killing of and eating Easter's ham, add in a bunny because that's a symbol of fertility for the ancient pagans, and so on. 
He even says this, it'll be easier for the pagans to accept Christ if you do this, because this is what they're used to doing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take Passover. I want you to change it. I want you to add in all these pagan things that the pagans are used to doing, because it'll be easier for them to convert to Christianity if you come on their side of the fence and start doing pagan things in pagan ways. And he's silent. What do you do? Do you do it? In the first century, you've never seen Halloween. You've never seen Christmas. You've never seen Easter. The only thing that you know is that all of your 11 brothers, the disciples, are celebrating the feast days. They're celebrating the Shabbat, the Sabbath. They're keeping Passover exactly the way it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, let us keep the feast of Passover, but let's do so with sincerity and truth and not drunkenness. You're doing these things and Satan comes along and says, no, 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 no. we've got to reach the masses. And here's how we do it. We change the name, add in a bunch of pagan stuff. What do you guys think? Who in their right mind in the first century would do that? They would say exactly what Yeshua said. Get behind me, Satan. Yet today, this is exactly what we've done. We've changed the name, changed the traditions, added a bunch of ancient pagan stuff, throw some holy water on it, try to Christianize it, try to justify it, hand out a few Bible tracts as if that's actually the way to witness to the world. The last time I checked, ladies and gentlemen, the way to witness to the world is to be separate and holy and kadosh from the world. It's to do Bible things in Bible ways and let them come to your house, not dressed up, but weeping, asking you for the gospel and the light that's inside of you. That's what my Bible says. Do not learn the way of the Gentiles is what my Bible says. Jeremiah chapter 10 says this in verse two. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the ways of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven for the Gentiles are dismayed at them for the the customs of the people are in vain. They're futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of a workman with the ax. They decorate it with silver and gold. Silver and gold. Silver and gold. Then they fasten it with nails and hammers so that will not topple. Got a picture right here out of Egypt. They're decorating a tree. It's a sacred tree in Egypt. Every culture had a sacred evergreen tree. You can watch it in truth or tradition if this is your first time. We are not to learn the ways of the Gentiles. You know what we need? We need an alternative. Let's call it a harvest festival. No, how about we just call it Sukkot? Ladies and gentlemen, the Christian church has been trying to find alternative for Halloween for 50 years. And I submit to you, Mr. or Mr. Christian, that God already has one. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a harvest festival. That's what it is. Why do we have to invent things when God has already perfected things? How many have heard of this trunk or treat? (laughs) Christian churches around the country. This is very popular now because we don't want to send our Christian kids out on the street in our subdivisions because they might get killed (laughs) or poisoned. How many when you were kids, man? I mean, somebody dropped an apple, you know, a candy apple in your bag. You ate it when you got home. Today, you drop a candy apple, it's Ebola. I mean, you know it is. It's laced in in something, cocaine. (laughs) So Christian parents don't want to do this. So what do they do? We invented something different. Let's all go to the church parking lots. Everybody bring your car, decorate your car, open up the trunk, get your lawn chair out, let all the kids go trunk to trunk. We'll call it trunk and trunk or treat. Listen, I I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but I'm fired up about this because, ladies and gentlemen, all we're doing is celebrating Samhain. We're just Christianizing something. 
Oh, but we don't want to deprive. I read someone on Facebook said, we should not deprive our children from celebrating a pagan festival. As long as we do it for Yahweh, we do it for the Lord. That's like another Christian leader saying, well, you know, Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, they don't still have roots in paganism. Now, wait a minute. How do you have roots in paganism and then like not have roots in paganism later? If an apple tree has apple roots, if you take the apple tree and do like a really neat carving and make it look like an olive tree, it doesn't change the roots. If you take the apples off and glue oranges to it, it does not make it an orange tree. You cannot take a pagan festival and glue crosses to the branches and make it Christian. The roots are pagan. And whenever you have pagan roots, listen to me, it only produces paganism. The seed of the fruit is what you look at. And I submit to you that Christians celebrating Halloween for the past 50 plus years have not produced a holy people. It has produced a watered down compromising church that does not know the word of God has fallen from its roots and doesn't even know the tree it's hanging from anymore. Oh, but we want to give, you know, candy and tracks and witness to people. Then witness 364 other days and you won't have to feel guilty about not witnessing tonight. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm saying it's wrong if you want to do that, if that's your conviction. But what I'm telling you is this, I lead people to Christ all the time. I don't need a pagan holiday to instigate it in my life. I don't need pagans to come to my door and start telling them about Christ. They don't want to hear it anyway. They want to hear trick or treat. They want candy. If you want to do something, leave this DVD on the front porch and put a sign to say why I don't celebrate Halloween. <laughs> At the end of the day, this is what the word compromise means, means coming from freedictionary.com to reduce in quality, value or degree to weaken or lower something. I put this picture on there to give and take. You know what? Because oh, give and take compromise is good. No, if you give something away, you're taking something from the other side. So when you want to compromise with the world, oh yeah, we're giving them something, but you're taking something from them and you don't even know it. You're robbing yourself of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Can you see Jesus? Can you see Yeshua, the Messiah, standing at a door, decorating his porch, sitting out there and handing out candy to people that are coming up dressed in demon outfits, celebrating an ancient Celtic, satanic, demonic festival from thousands of years ago that was started by his arch enemy, the sun god, Baal. Not at all. Maybe he would start a campaign on November 1st when it's over with. Trying to get them a year later to not celebrate Halloween. Yes, he came to overcome death. Yes, he came to mock spirits, but he did not create a holiday to do so. It is an unauthorized day. Martin Luther said this, and I'm not a huge Martin Luther fan. Other than this, he had enough guts to take his 95 theses and nail it to the Wartenberg church door in 1511 and say, I had enough. I don't want to leave, but these are the things that are problems in the church. And I resonated with this statement when I read it. 
unless I'm convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reasons of arguments and arguments, I can and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And I will only change one word. I will not retreat, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against the word of God. The Christian might say, might not be convinced, and that's okay. We're still brothers and I still love you. But I want you to highly consider that this day is not holy. It's an unholy day. It's an unauthorized day. And the precedent in Scripture for taking something that is pagan, the golden calf incident alone, and trying to Christianize it and lift it up to God is forbidden in Scripture. In Scripture, It's forbidden. We are to come out of Egypt. We are not to ask it if we can come back and join it on a day. Imagine if millions of Christian homes across the world, across the nation, decided I'm not going to celebrate an ancient pagan festival that has simply been decorated with a little bit of holy water. I'm shutting my doors on that day. What if every Christian in America chose not to celebrate Halloween? What if every Christian decided to celebrate God's holy days and not Satan's fixed up and dressed up? And like the famous phrase is, you can put lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. So you want to kiss a pig with lipstick, that's fine. But when you take that blindfold off, you're not going to be happy. And at the end of the day, when our blindfold on judgment day is taken off and God shows you outside of time. Why it's so offensive when we do pagan things in pagan ways and not Bible things in Bible ways? Because when he looks down and he sees these little children dressed up as whatever. At the same time, because he's outside of time, he sees little children being sacrificed with bone fires and the people dressing up as demons to try to trick the demons to leave them alone. He has not called his people to mix for the purpose of witnessing. The biblical definition of witnessing is to be holy. And the definition of holy is to be kadosh, separated we say, well, Jim, if I separate, they, they won't, uh, you know, then I'm going to be like, you know, they'll be like, oh, you're pious. I, you know, you're too good for me. No, that is the lie from the pit of hell. When you separate yourself, not in, 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 a, in a sarcastic way of looking down on them, but when you in love separate yourself from the unholy, a line gets demarcated in the sand. A line gets drawn in the sand and it becomes clear. Which God is which? And at the end of their day, when Halloween parties are over and their drunken orgies are done with, they're dead, hungry, thirsty, and starving, hurting, going back to marriages that are falling apart. And they only know that that person down the street has a great marriage. My coworker is brilliant and shining. Why don't you celebrate Halloween? This is why. Well, you know what? You, gotta, you seem to have, can you give me some advice on my wife? You see, when we come out of the world, we become a, a beacon in the night. When you hang around people that, that, are, that are not of Yahweh, but are of the world, they put bushels on your light and you don't even know it. This is why I would hope most of you in this room and those of you who are watching online, when I asked the question in the first century, would you do this if Satan told you to, to take a holiday that God said was holy and change the name and add a bunch of pagan stuff? You would never do it. But we do it today. And we justify it by as well, you can't be, you know, if you can't beat him, you might as well join him. I want to witness. I know this sounds crazy and it goes against your intuitiveness. You are not allowed to enter into a pagan festival 
with the purpose of witnessing. Let me give you the law of extrapolation to prove it to you. You are not allowed to go into a strip club to witness to the ladies on stage. But if you believe that you can hand out and witness to kids coming to your door and enter into a pagan festival and Christianize it, you're creating a law that says that you can do the same thing. Because how come I can't go into a strip club and witness if I can witness in this? They're both pagan. They're both demonic. They're both evil. They're both, uh, both of the world. That means that you get to play God. You get to play scripture. You get to create the laws, the instructions for how to witness to God's, to, to the people of the world. I submit to you, we do Bible things in Bible ways. We leave the world out of it and let the chips fall where they may. And you'll watch the church at large worldwide go from a compromised, watered down church that doesn't know, come here from Sikkim and can't tell you what Lamentations is about. To a church that begins to grow and mature, strong in the faith, uncompromising. I'm telling you, this is the day that we nail onto the doors of the church at large today. And we say, enough is enough. I'm done compromising. I will stand with my king and his word. And I will not falter and I will not waver. Let's pray. Stand with me, please. Father God, I ask in the name of your son that you would forgive us for our compromising spirit, for our always wanting to justify so that we can do something that satisfies our flesh. There's no other reason, God. People give the reasons that we shouldn't deny our children to having fun. Well, you know what? The Bible says sin is fun. So should we deny our children from sinning? We're teaching our children to compromise God. Oh, Jim, you're going overboard. It's time to go overboard. Father Yahweh, I ask that you would pour out your mercy and your grace on your church today. Forgive us, for we have literally fallen to such a degree that we don't even recognize evil. And the prophecies are coming true, God, where we call holy evil and evil holy. God, this is not a day to mock spirits. This day glorifies the enemy. And every Christian really knows that. Father, I pray you teach us the truth of how you told us how to mock spirits. We want to mock the enemy. We live a holy life. We live a life that is uncompromisingly sanctified. Walking in your ways. And the enemy can't touch us. That is the greatest way to mock him. Father, forgive our generations past, for they knew not what they did. But today is the day, now is the time, God, that we can change the future. Change the future generations. Pull us back into the ancient covenants, God. We want an alternative, God. Help us to turn to you. You already have the best of the best. Forgive us that we don't even know what the alternative is. And Yahweh, I pray you'd infuse a new generation with a backbone strong and secure, backed by the mighty word from your throne. Father, I pray that people will be saved, not because we compromise. If anyone gets saved because we compromise, it is only because your love is greater than our compromise. But it is your will that your people step out from the world not join hands. Father, thank you that you didn't compromise. Thank you that you never compromised your word. Sanctify us, God. Grow us, mature us. Help us to stop caring about what our neighbor thinks and to love our neighbor as ourself. In Yeshua's name, amen. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. 
Thank you, and God bless.